we've all seen conductors tap the music stand like that in TV commercials and movies, right? But I've got a secret for you. Almost no conductor ever does that. It's actually very authoritarian and it feels kind of disrespectful to the musicians on stage, not to mention that you could break a perfectly good baton and these things are expensive. So what does a conductor actually do on the podium? Well, making my living as an orchestra conductor for the last 25 years or so, I've learned that my job is a total mystery to most people. Does a conductor even have an effect on the orchestra's sound? I mean, couldn't they play just fine on their own? Well, raise your hand if you've ever thought maybe conductors just enjoy dancing in the middle of the orchestra. <laughs> yeah, okay, a few of you. Well, I'll tell you a secret, actually, we kind of do. Um, but there's more to it than that. In fact, at its core, what good conductors do on the podium offer valuable insights for all of us on how to lead our teams more effectively and collaborate better with others. Now, as much as it pains me to admit it, an orchestra can, in fact, play without a conductor. In fact, there are quite a few professional orchestras, most famously the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra in New York, whose whole brand identity is based around performing without a conductor. And then meanwhile, at traditional orchestras who almost always play with a conductor, lots of the musicians are openly skeptical about how much value most conductors have. And so, are they right to be skeptical? Well, these musicians from YOSA, or Youth Orchestras of San Antonio, just showed us an orchestra can absolutely play without a conductor. They were playing, by the way, a rondo that the English composer Henry Purcell wrote more than 300 years ago. So if they can play so well without a conductor, is there added value in a conductor being present? Well, in 2012, Yanis Alemonos, who's the director of the Computer Vision Laboratory at the University of Maryland, teamed up with some colleagues to study this very question of the conductor's value. Working with an Italian orchestra, they placed tiny infrared lights in a conductor's baton and on the bows of the musicians in the orchestra. By surrounding the orchestra with infrared cameras, they were able to capture the patterns in space created by the movements of these lights. So, did the conductor actually lead the musicians? Thank God, yes. <laughs> When they crunched the numbers, Alemonos and his team found that the conductor's movement patterns were in fact predicting the movements of the orchestra's bows and not the other way around. And in even better news for those of us who conduct, the scientists also had two different conductors wield the infrared baton. One was an experienced veteran musician and conductor, and the other was an amateur with just a little bit of knowledge of the basics. Both conductors were actually found to be leading the musicians. But a panel of musical experts also listened to both performances without knowing which was which, and they decided in this blind test that the veteran conductor got better musical results. So score one for a conductor actually having a measurable impact on the sound. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> but how do we do it? When I get involved, I could go, thank you. When I get involved, I can go overboard. And I shaped the sound there, but it was probably a little too much. Everybody's taste is different. But to me, that performance distorted the music rather than enhancing it. And as leaders, all of us can do this sometimes. All of us can go too far. So the key to doing better is for me to shape the sound without making it all about me. So 
that was better, or at least I hope it was. So how do I shape the sound and lead the musicians without getting in the way? Well, Robert Greenleaf's classic concept of servant leadership is a useful lens for thinking about this. I want to serve the composer's vision, I want to serve the musicians, and I want to serve the audience. So for you, you can think of the composer as your team's mission or vision, the musicians as your coworkers or colleagues, and the audience as your customers. Aspiring to lead should grow out of a strong passion for this kind of leadership to everybody, for this kind of commitment, leadership, and service to everybody involved. If we lead first without this commitment to service, then the outcomes are almost always forced or phony. Now, conducting also offers a useful lesson in humility. Humility is not a word we often associate with conductors, by the way, but <laughs> when I was 19, I started working with Joseph Primavera, who was a legendary youth orchestra conductor in Philadelphia, and he said to me more than once, never forget, you're the only musician on stage who isn't making any sound. You think anybody wants to come to your solo concert? It gets old real fast. <laughs> so all of us, ultimately, should think of ourselves like the musician who isn't making any sound. Great leadership usually isn't about being the rock star. Instead, imagine yourself standing among your colleagues, unleashing their potential to do their best work. It's an amazing feeling to stand in the middle of things, surrounded by the sweep of the full orchestra, silently unleashing everybody else's sound. Well, you won't get to stand in the middle of that amazing sweep of sound unless you can get things started. Probably the most important gesture in a conductor's work is called the preparatory beat. Our goal is to show the tempo and mood of the music with one motion. And if we do this well, then the musicians can keep playing for quite a while with no more support from the conductor. Now, on the other hand, few things annoy or frustrate an orchestra more than a conductor whose preparatory beat doesn't match the tempo that comes after it. You see what I mean? Now, in non-musical leadership, many of us do this far too often. Instead, we should try to personify the results we want. Before the work begins, think about what your team needs to sound like and look like, and then model that with every fiber of your being. Think about things like how you talk about a project before it starts, about what your team needs from you in order to be ready to execute, or about setting the tone by giving 100%. That's not easy, of course. During my conducting studies with Joseph Primavera, I was trying to learn how to start Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is as especially tricky. <sighs> On the 20th attempt, I was convinced my preparatory beat, but the orchestra still wasn't together. Primavera put his hand on my shoulder and said, your baton was okay, but your face isn't there yet. We need to see the sound in everything you show us. Now, every piece of music also offers countless tiny choices. Are we going to slow down here? How much? And then when and how will we speed back up again? Now imagine 20 or 40 or even 100 musicians needing to agree on all of these answers. A conductor offers a streamlining of this decision-making process. So, great, leaders make decisions. We know that. But for a conductor to hold on to the confidence of the orchestra, those decisions need to be based in evidence. And in what we do as conductors, that evidence is the score, the notes on paper put there by the composer. By carefully studying the score and working to understand the composer's intent, a conductor can offer the orchestra efficiency, but more importantly, the satisfaction of getting it right. 
So in your work, who's the composer? What's the score? Well, again, think about things like your mission, your vision, your strategic plan. And here's the most important thing I'll probably say all day today. Try to be the person who can connect the dots between the minutia of the moment and those overarching goals of the team. Of course, you can't connect those dots if you don't listen well. And another thing that frustrates an orchestra to no end is a conductor who doesn't seem to hear the details of what's going on in the moment. It's not just about wrong notes. It's about judging how, which instruments should balance or blend with each other. It's about whether a note should be piercing or smooth. It's about managing a million tiny details without losing track of the larger flow of the piece. That's probably why Maestro Primavera once said to me, Troy, you should spend 75% of your time studying scores and the other 75% of your time <laughs> training your ear to hear better and better. And when I pointed out to him that that didn't quite add up, he said, ah, well, remember, there's three kinds of conductors, those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> so if we know the score well and we listen carefully, we still need to be able to offer useful feedback. And as a conductor, I need to know a lot about every instrument in the orchestra, but I also need to understand that my musicians know more about their instruments than I do. I always try to focus on describing the sound that I want, the sound the composer needs, but trusting the musicians to figure out how to make that sound. Instead of telling Kathleen which finger to use to play an F sharp, what if I can give her some insight into why that F sharp matters or who she should blend with as she plays it? And then, what if I could lead like that off the podium? What if we all could? Building a shared vision of what we're trying to accomplish and empowering others to get there. In the end, when it all comes together, that's what conducting an orchestra feels like. So finally, what's the most important parallel between conducting and leadership? Never take a bow alone. Troy, let me ask you who we have here. Can you uh, introduce us to uh, these great musicians? Our musicians this morning, we have Blaine Bryan, Trisha Park, Victoria Day, Lindy Fiedler, Maddie Gonzalez, Victoria Acuna, Jimily Dyermach, Victoria Juarez, Kathleen Ryan, Victoria Clownig, and Emma, Emma Jacks. So your name has to be Victoria to, in order There's to- There's a lot of Victorias, Victorias these yeah, exactly. days, absolutely. Another big hand for the members of the Youth Orchestras of San Antonio. 
and Troy Peters.